So welcome back to the Fashion Sustain conference. I hope you enjoyed my little chat with Alexandra. The focus was on local production, sustainably made uh, uh, ownership of a label. And we've, uh, we switched the focus from, from leather production in Germany to the huge field of the denim industry. And yeah, I'm unfortunately, I'm really alone in the studio right now. But we have many interesting guests out there in the cyberspace, so to speak. So I would like to hand over to Miguel, who will be the moderator of the next panel, which is, as mentioned before, Denim Innovation, a 360 industry inside. So Miguel, the stage is yours, if you can take it away. Oh, th thanks very much. Thanks very much. Uh, well, first of all, good day to all following the streaming. I hope you are doing well. Uh, and thanks very much for uh, having this possibility to participate at the Neonit uh, Fashion Sustain panel. As it was mentioned, we are going to discuss about innovation and denim. It's a very important topic. Tomorrow we have another panel. It's going to be about uh, cotton and denim. And I am surrounded by a group of experts on different fields on the denim uh, manufacturing line. So I think it's best to start with uh, introductions. So I invite you to introduce yourselves with a short message. Maybe Alberto, Alberto Candiani, you can start being the, to break the ice. <laughs> Hi, Miguel, thank you. Yes, my name is Alberto Candiani. I am the owner and the president of Candiani Denim, um, which has been owned by my family uh, since 1938. So I'm the fourth generation of a true Italian textile company. What about you, Maurizio? Hi, Miguel. Hi, guys. Thanks for this opportunity. I'm Maurizio Morosini. I'm the sales director at Tonello. Um, Tonello is an Italian company producing garment finishing technologies. So I'm happy to be here with you guys. Great. And now it's Michael. Hi, Michael. Hello, Miguel. Hello, everybody. My name is Michael Kinnemanth. Um, I work for Lensing Fibers. Uh, Austrian based company. I work out of the UK. Um, I started the denim business in 1975. So um, I'm an old man now. <laughs> no, that's not true. <laughs> okay, Alberto, <laughs> your turn. Hi, this is, um, this is Alberto De Conti. Um, happy to be with all of you today. I'm with the Rudolf Group. Um, that is a German manufacturer of uh, textile chemical auxiliaries based in Bavaria, south of Munich. And I'm responsible for global marketing. OK, so thanks all. Um, maybe we can start with uh, some direct questions to each of you. Uh, so we understand uh, the scope of innovation in your expertise on your expert field. Maybe we can start with, with you, Alberto, Alberto Candiani. We have two Albertos today. Mm -hmm. So. Um, for a denim mill like and then, I mean, what what is what is innovation? Is is basically implementing proposals coming from other other companies, or new fibers, new chemicals. So, what what is innovation at, at a denim mill level? Well, innovation is everything uh, for us. Um, I mean, at Candiani, we are purists of innovation uh, for the simple reason that. Um, denim is something extremely hard to innovate if you look at a pair of jeans a pair of jeans it's a pair of jeans if you will but there's so much going on in that pair of jeans and <laughs> and coming to those ingredients you were talking about i wish it was that easy but let me be very italian for a second it's like um cooking make a good dish of pasta let, let's let's put it this way let, let's look at denim like uh, as a dish of pasta you can get the best ingredients the best pasta, the best sauce, the best onion, the best oil, the best salt, everything doesn't necessarily mean you're going to make the best pasta ever. So in order to make the best pasta, first place, you have to have Italian blood. And that is something uh, which is in your DNA. And as Italians, I always say we are a little bit artists, a little bit engineers, a little bit creative and a little bit technicians, you know. And I do believe that ingredients are crucial. There's no way you can make a dish of pasta without good ingredients. And at the same time, the way you put them together, the way you manage the flame, the way you boil the water, the, the way you put salt at the right moment, the way you garnish it, 
that makes a big, big difference. So again, when it comes to denim, it's not that easy. Uh, making good tissue pasta is actually much easier than making good denim, especially today. <laughs> it, 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 I, it is more about um, combining those ingredients with the right technologies, connecting the dots in a way that if you want to be innovative, you have to connect those dots that maybe other people are not even seeing. If you don't see that dot, there's no line you can trace between one and the other. And that really includes processes. It includes technology, as I said. It does include those ingredients. It does include experience as well. But uh, again, to be Italian, that experience doesn't simply reflect on things you've done by the book in the past. If you want to innovate, sometimes you want to invent. And that means don't stick to the book, know the book. You need to know the books in general, but use your creativity. And in the end, innovation or R&D, research and development is still the most fun part of what we do, especially today where you, you don't really have to make just a beautiful pair of jeans or beautiful fabrics. You have to make good fabrics, good jeans in a more responsible way, knowing what you're doing. So knowing the ingredients, knowing which processes, what technologies to use in order to make a better fabric, a better pair of jeans. That's good. Yeah, thank you. I, I like the example of uh, preparing a pizza. It's, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a good thing. I, ca I can adopt this for the paella, okay? <laughs> Same thing. Uh, let's move to, to Michael. Um, Michael, the, the, the so-called man-made synthetic fibers are becoming very, very important on denim. Very, very important. You know, they are part of, of, the, of the material, basic materials that, that are used on denim. Uh, why do you think, what do you think is the main reason for this upsurge of man-made synthetic fibers to be used on denim? Um, I, <laughs> I don't know if I have the answer even. Um, when I first joined uh, Tencel back in the mid-90s, um, man-made it really didn't have a position in denim. And um, I'm not really sure what energized or catalyzed product development in denim. I think uh, really in the last 10 years has been a real explosion of activity in the industry and almost um, product development has become a DNA of the denim industry. Um, and much more acceptance of uh, different technologies. We are one of those ingredients that Alberta was talking about. And I think um, the industry moved away from just focusing on vintage and history and heritage. And so today you have a much more broader definition of denim than there ever was. Um, uh, we tried to think about this inside our company. Uh, we, were, we were trying to define denim for our senior management. And in reality, uh, although denim is primarily cotton from a fiber point of view, it's not exclusively cotton. It's not exclusively indigo dyed. Um, it's not even exclusively a woven fabric. Um, and so today there's a lot more room uh, in product for, for, for a lot more things, a lot more dye stuffs, a lot more fibers. Um, and I think the reality is all those elements um, give you the opportunity to make uh, much more interesting products. Um, I don't think there is the same level of elitism or, or snobbery in the industry. Uh, for instance, at one time, you know, stretch for menswear would have been a complete no-no. But today, I think that's the, that's the, uh, the fastest expanding area in denim is into men's stretch. So I think for, for man-made cellulosics, um, it's been a great opportunity to blend into products. And man-made cellulosics have been able to adapt to environmental issues of the day. So, for instance, on recycling, we have a Tencel product now we brand as Refibra because we're putting recycled content in there. Our latest developments are on carbon reduction. Um, yes. So we're able to ad ad adopt and adapt to whatever the issues are of the day. Right, that, that's, a good, that's a good point. Maybe we can co continue with, uh, with uh, 
example that, that uh, Alberto said, we could say that uh, Monday shows the cabbage could be the mozzarella of the <laughs> of the denim, right? Can we'll take that. We'll take that. <laughs> yes. Okay, just continue with the example. I love it. <laughs> uh, now is uh, Alberto, Alberto de Conte, and, and I will drag him drag him to uh, quick sense because we are going to speak about chemicals. Okay. Uh, we know we know each other for so many years, Alberto. We are we're working on the same <laughs> thing. Yes, yes, me, uh, let me, yes. Uh, let me ask you a question. That okay, I have to ask. Um, so why the term chemical? Chemical, you know, is it still misused, misunderstood? So with all the efforts that the chemical companies are doing to present chemical in, the, you know, the right way, we are doing the right things, and but still, you people refer to chemicals as. Oops, this is <laughs> terrible. What do you think is that? Oh, Miguel, that is the question, isn't it? Uh, it, is, it is true that chemistry has developed a bad name, especially in certain environments. And that is, and that is quite unfortunate um, because we all loved studying chemicals as chemistry at school, didn't we? <laughs> Maybe that's not really yes. true. <laughs> but it's quite unfortunate because a a textile denim industry or any other industry for what that matters is quite unconceivable nowadays without chemistry just think about it I mean, it's, it's everywhere and you know it, we cannot do with that mm -hmm. in our industry i think there are two main reasons uh behind such a distorted perception well the first one is i think a, a sort of an inappropriate use of chemical auxiliaries and we and we regularly see it, or we used to see where we could travel, you know, around the world. What often happens is that, you know, given a certain chemical auxiliaries, that is used with all the required precautions so long it is within the perimeter of the chemical company. As soon as it gets out and to the users, to some users, the very same chemical can all of a sudden be used in a very casual, unconcerned, and even careless way. And it's yeah. the same chemical auxiliary. So on this point, maybe there is something, you know, that we can do, you know, as, as chemical industry in terms of education, right? You know, maybe there is something that we can do there. And then there is the other point that is giving uh, chemistry a bad name. And that goes back again to the example of, you know, pasta and cooking, because chemistry is the ingredient, isn't it? or we cotton one of the ingredients. And I'm mainly referring to, uh, let's call them cheap chemicals, usually byproducts of other industries that find their way into the textile processes. Uh, they can be hidden in very inexpensive commodity chemicals coming as byproducts of industrial sources, such as metal processing, coal burning in power plants, etc. you name it. So they yeah. can carry through the so-called unintentionally added substances, potentially harmful, really well in the contaminants that remain on the textile, and that's troubles. So that's why, you know, we invite everyone that is involved in the purchasing of chemical auxiliaries to be very careful about what they buy. Um, even, you know, when, and especially when the price is very attractive. Stupid chemistry is cheap, but it stays stupid. Okay, that's, that's, that, that's good. <laughs> Um, and now we, we, we spoke about the Pomodoro, maybe, of the pizza with the chemicals, right? <laughs> uh, we, need to, we need to talk uh, with Maurizio maybe about the oven, okay? The conditions for the pizza <laughs> to, to, to be cooked. Yeah, I don't know, Maurizio, if you like this. <laughs> I like it. Uh, I like it. Okay. I, like like it. it? I was thinking okay. about the, yeah, the pot or, you know, the technology <laughs> to be used for cooking, but I like this oh, association. No, no. You are, you, are, you are the oven of the pizza because what comes from the oven is actually what is going to be offered to the yeah, consumers, it's right? It's true, it's true, it's so, true. Marisa, there is a, a lot of um, uh, promotion uh, out there in the world for, for new technologies and involving, okay, uh, ozones and lasers and all the type of technologies and everything. And uh, it's a good way to go. But, but uh, Marisa, how, how is the actual current level of adoption of these new technologies in in the in the garment finishing, I mean, is is it growing fast? Is is it still a long way to go? What 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 is the status? 
Well, I would say that it is uh, something in between what you just mentioned. It is uh, somehow growing fast, but it's, there is a long way to go still. So there is space for improvement. There is space for large space for adoption, especially when it comes to certain technologies like uh, ozone, for example, and uh, and lasers as well. Uh, but more and more companies have started this uh, path uh, some time back. And uh, today, probably, this uh, adoption is even accelerated by uh, the, the phenomenon of uh, the near shorting that we are seeing. Yeah. So we yeah. see uh, production coming back to places where, uh, where it wasn't anymore since last time, since since long time. So uh, that that is good. That is good. So th this phenomenon, as well as uh, the fact that, uh, uh, for example, when it comes to us, uh, uh, we have uh, customers all over the world, and uh, mostly in uh, places like Pakistan and Bangladesh, we we saw uh, situations and laundries in which the level of technology is uh, very high. Uh, as compared to other places, uh, but now, now, luckily, even in uh, geographies nearby, nearby us, uh, where prob probably the investment were a little bit in standby, um, we see we see this uh, this phenomenon taking place of uh, uh, renovation, uh, renewal of uh, of uh, uh, the the machine range, uh, so. Uh, the adoption of uh, state-of-the-art technology is happening again here by us, and this is also helped by by the fact that in certain countries uh, there is the subsidy of uh, the local government, and uh, you know this this is important too. Yes, the support from from the uh, policymakers. This is very very important to uh, help the industry. Yeah. Um, let's go. Let's go for a second round of questions. But but please um, make your answers a bit shorter because there are some interesting topics for the, for the for the panel discussion. So let's go back to the pizza uh, example. Um, so Alberto, when do you think uh, you know an idea? What do you feel? It's a kind of feeling, right? When do, when do you feel that a new thing is going to be or could be a, a success? I mean, when when do you say, okay, this is the thing? That, you know it's gonna be so they will love it well there's a lot of gambling because as i said today it's not just about making a good looking fabric or with a little more performance a little less a little more stretchy a little thicker a little heavier lighter it's it's about changing the contents changing uh, the design actually especially at candiani we are always thinking our fabrics the other way around i mean we're always looking at the end of life of that fabric so or a pair of jeans made with that fabric uh, for instance i mean to give you a straight answer uh, when you achieve a patent and a patent in order to achieve as to present a solution to an existing problem when you solve that problem and you achieve a patent then you you you've done it then you know it's going to be big like coreva which is our latest strongest innovation we're talking biodegradable bio-based elastomer that replaces synthetic and non i mean non-biodegradable elastomers i mean we created stress stretch genes which could biodegrade could go compost compostable again because we thought that at the end of life that fabric can be recycled and whatever it is left over uh, can be addressed to agriculture as a biofertilizer. So when, when you achieve something like this, which has to be tangibly proven by data and science, then you believe you achieve something. Yeah, that's a good example. I mean, to have elastanes that can basically be composted, that's that's a great thing. Um, Michael, we are talking about uh, malmesorosic fibers and cotton, like if they were in competition. Uh, what do you think is still missing? I mean, why? What is the difference between cotton and, let's say, for example, lyocell stencils or, or, or refibras or, 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 or bus recast? What is still the gap to be covered between malmesterosic fibers and cotton? And what is required to, you know, go close to cotton, go closer to cotton? Yeah, you're on mute. Um, well, I think there's economy of scale is one thing. Um, 
if, if you look at the, there's over 100 million tons of fiber produced every year about 25 million tons of that is cotton and only about six million tons is man-made cellulosics so it's availability it's scalability and um i mean one thing we're up against for instance I looked at the subsidies that were given out by the US government on cotton from about 1999 to about 2010. And it's, it was billions. If, if, that, if that billions were spent on man-made cellulosic plants, instead of being 6 million tons a year, it would be 60 million tons a year. So yes. that's the scale of things. Um, but the other thing is, I mean, clearly cotton is king in denim and there's no getting away with it. Cotton is the most suitable fiber for denim. Um, but there is a place for every fiber. And I think, you know, there's obvious performance differences. And so if you look at viscose, for instance, you know, it has relatively poor wet and dry strength, poor chemical resistance, low stiffness. So it's not super compatible. But we, when you get to tensile layer cell, um, those weaknesses are taken away and it becomes a good blending partner. And I think the, the, the rise of multi-blends in the industry is something where one fiber can compensate for another. Um, mm -hmm. I also think it's just down to lack of, lack of knowledge within the supply chain, of particularly at brand and retailer level, about understanding what, what certain fibers can do for the product. So um, I think education is a big thing. And um, I think that's that's a long-term problem for us. I've no doubt Mambe cellulosics are here to stay. Um, if you look at the short, shortcomings of other fibres, um, you know, uh, peak oil um, for, the, for the synthetics, competition from food crops uh, on land for cotton, you know, accusations about slavery on cotton, other things are going to have to come in and uh, and supplement that. And cellulose being the most ab abundant natural organic polymer available globally, I've no doubt that the future of of, of cellulose is 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 here to stay because uh, essentially it's a an exhaustible source of raw material. We just, we just to adapt uh, my mesolosic fibers to the to the requirements of the market, right? So it's innovation required to make it good for any kind of performance required, right? I would say so, yeah. I mean, innovation in our own industry. Uh, I mean, and I, I think today, you know, uh, with the collaborations that we try and do in the supply chain, I think we're positioning man-made cellulosics in a much more stronger position today. Right. Um, Alberto, Alberto de Conte, um, there was a question I wanted to ask you about the stupid chemistry, which is a, an expression that I love very much. But as you covered this a little bit on your previous um, <laughs> answer, uh, talking about the impurities and uh, uh, you know uh, things on the, on the chemicals that shouldn't be there. But let me ask you about something. Um, so how can we tackle that? I mean, how can we certify, uh, clean, uh, test, so how can we do that uh, today? I mean, uh, there are so many, there's a little bit of confusion about, about you know, all these eco-certifications, eco-labelings, and people putting in stamps and everything. How is this confusion affecting the innovation? I mean, how is this confusion about the eco-something labelling registration affecting the innovation on the chemical field? Mm. But you're, you're right, uh, Miguel. Now, all we are talking about in the industry is certification, certification, certifications. You know, every kind of, uh, you know, we move away from what the subject really is, and the and the and the, and the subject is really chemistry, the quality of chemistry, how it's produced, what it is, etc. There is no good and bad chemistry. You know, there is chemistry that is you know sort of plain stupid. Again, I go back to what we said before, and let's call it, I mean, intelligent chemistry for lack of a better word. That. The intelligent chemistry that is generated through alternative and responsible thinking that is different than say it's certified you know it's done in a different way it's done in a more responsible way it's done in a more conscious way uh, that new breeze of chemistry can definitely help overcome you know bad perceptions um and the latest chemistry necessarily embraces a notion of innovation and there is quite a lot 
of it being studied as as we speak you know uh, the use of natural raw materials as as alternative to crude oil is an example and mm -hmm. you know at rudolf you are doing a lot of in that field um in terms of using both um natural raw materials as well as uh plastics that are coming from you know uh post-consumer waste and that is probably the latest frontier of you know of of chemistry that is really really um what yeah. keeps us busy at the moment. Um, if you allow me, and I know that I have to be quick, but there is perhaps something that we can quickly expand on this point. As soon as we use the word natural, you know, I can see eyes that opens widely and, and people get really excited about it. But is natural really always better? And really better than what? Let's make an example, you know, let's talk about softness. We, we all use softeners in a way or another in textile industries. We can decide to go synthetic, you know, and use uh, silicons that are made out of silica, which is the seventh most abundant element in the universe and the second most abundant element on, on this planet. Or we can go natural, you know, and then we can use cationic softener made from natural sources that are in direct competition with other industries, namely food. Is that better? I mean, I, I don't know. It's a very complex subject. It needs to be debated. And I think uh, that is where we need to have constructive uh, dialogues rather than these certifications or rather the other certifications. Certifications are important, you know, but they are uh, something that support the whole dialogue, not the dialogue. Yeah, that, that's something we need to probably have a, a, a different panel about, okay, this, to discuss about certifications. This, it in itself is such a complicated and, and hot topic that yeah, it deserves to have a specific <laughs> discussion it about it. Yeah. Uh, Maurizio, uh, when when you promote, or when the, the, the equipments for laundry is are promoted, uh, the, all the focus is on the environmental advantages, the water savings and the chemical savings and everything. But don't you think that there is also um, a social part? So the so yeah, sorry, Maurizio. So so also the social part is important because actually you you keep workers away from from dangerous. So why why the social part is not more you know obvious more more visible in in the promotion of these new technologies? That's a very good question, Miguel. Um, I totally totally agree with you. Um, this is uh, uh, technology is meant uh, to be to be used uh, to avoid uh, certain certain practices you know, and certain operations that are dangerous for. Uh, for the workers. So uh, when it comes when it comes to that, and when uh, and when technologies are really used for that, uh, uh, in a proper way, because this is also another important task, um, then we we achieve uh, this target. Uh, so the, the social responsibility, you know, which is uh, absolutely important. And to us, uh, to us is part of uh, sustainability. Whenever we talk about uh, uh, sustainability, which we prefer to to name uh, responsibility or to to say that we produce responsible technologies, is uh, because also we we think about that and we think about the the, the workers that use the technology in a way that should be totally safe. So that's very important. So we we try to avoid uh, manual operations and we try to avoid operations uh, that are dangerous, whether it is because we avoid the use of hazardous chemicals or because we avoid uh, some repetitive uh, um, yeah, operations or jobs, duties that, uh, that are not, not so good uh, for the healthy mm -hmm. of, of the people. Um, then, then, it, then it's fine. Uh, of course, what is very important is also to um, to guarantee the right environment for the people to to work properly, to work in a safe uh, in a safe way, and also to uh, to give uh, some uh, added value to the work they do and to and to the garment they create. You know, we start in a, in a very romantic way talking about food. To me, food is romantic. So, uh, you know, the worker, the worker, the, the, the people that uh, create uh, a garment uh, are giving a soul to the product, you know, so mm -hmm. they are, they are a key factor. Uh, so we okay. must be, we must be careful and 
probably, you know, uh, this is also good. Increasing the level of technology uh, mm -hmm. will create uh, new job opportunities and we will maybe bring back people to our industry, you know, because this is one of the issues we have. Yes, it's very important, I mean, to bring back people with high skills to uh, handle uh, yeah. the new Venom industry, that's right. Well, we have 15 minutes to go, and I have a lot of questions here uh, for the panel. Please, all you can speak all at the same time if you like, okay? There's no limit. So I have a lot of questions, but I will have to focus, or we will have to focus on basically three. Um, so let me ask you, the, the first one is going to be our greenwashing, okay? We all know what greenwashing is, and it's, a, it's killing, killing business. So how do you think that innovation presented by you could uh, uh, kill or can improve greenwashing? And what is, what is missing? Are, are the brands understanding the real meaning of innovation? Do, do, do they understand what you're promoting as a way of, listen, this is good, and you can, you can offer it as a good thing. So you can move away from greenwashing. What, what, how can we kill greenwashing with innovation? Any of you, all of you, please. As I said earlier, you have to make, okay, innovation right now can only be sustainable innovation. There's no point of making something new, which is polluting more than, than the previous generation, whatever you do. Uh, absolutely. Cars or whatever. I mean, maybe car, not the best example. I mean, whatever, but yeah. in general. Um, then you have to make it tangible. You have to have, as I said earlier, science proof. And in order to do so, you have to find a very different way to communicate about it, so to create education without boring or terrifying the consumer. If you if you think B two C, actually this is this is a claim I, I suddenly use B two B two C business to consumer type of communication needs to replace the C that stands as consumer in a new C that means citizen. Just talk to the citizen for a second and not to the consumer. Business to citizen is a whole different perspective that makes you communicate in a different way, meaning that you are not leveraging sustainability as a marketing tool in order to sell more, but you are educating about what sustainably you do, the citizen, and why eventually that citizen then we we'll have to make a choice, I mean, to buy this or that, but you will give him, you provide him more information so he can make his own choice. I, I, I believe greenwashing right now is just a nightmare because sustainability is such a big, you know, uh, scam. I mean, we all hate to use the word sustainability. You and I, Miguel, talked about it a thousand times. Still, I'm convinced that it's actually a better thing if the world is at least aware of what sustainability should be. But in order to differentiate what sustainability is and what should be, it's our duty together with the brands, because as you mentioned, brands, honestly speaking, if you give them, I don't know, 10, probably they understand two or three <laughs> and so you need to back, to back them up but you do need to back them up it's my job i mean we need to back them up with information and we all do here in this panel we all do so Absolutely. again and then the brands should use the right communication in order to make sustainable innovation something cool that the consumer or the citizen finally would care about yes uh, is there anything you want to add, uh, Alberto, Michael, Maurizio, on, on what I would, Yeah, I, I would say that, I mean, consumers can only buy what's put in front of them. So I think for this period we are in, uh, you know, the contract is between the supply chain and brands and retailers. And I think it's difficult because, you know, you go to a trade show, you have maybe a hundred booths there, fabric mills, chemical guys, fiber guys. We've all got our stories. Maybe we have five stories, 10 new stories, times a hundred companies. So somebody walking into that show is bombarded with a thousand messages. And it's science and technology versus art and design. Um, so how many of those things are even understood on any level? And at the, at the next trade show or the next year, all of the supply chain guys 
have got rid of all those 10 ideas and we've got 10 new ideas. So we've, we've, we've generated 10,000 probably pretty good ideas and they're all, they're all going to waste. Um, I think that the fact that brands and retailers now are, um, are creating and employing people in their sustainability departments, at least we've got, we've got people who probably begin to understand science and environment and understand the messages we are giving them. Um, I think the supply chain is doing a, a lot of great work, um, but for the moment, I think it's in some cases it's falling on deaf ears. Uh, and I think also I think it's unfortunate. You know, my kids have grown up understanding phrases like you know uh, climate change or whatever that they are. They've got a vocabulary that I never had when I was young. So when that generation is old enough they be, be able to understand these messages more. But I think we still have to wait for that generation to be consumers. I, I agree with you, Michael. When, when there is, uh, there is some, uh, 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 you know, something to be considered, don't size on that, is when there are so much information around, the filters, filtering the information is critical. Because otherwise, as Alberto mentioned, I mean, it's, you know, it's too much to digest, okay? So there must be kind of filter or education, as, as you mentioned. We have 10 minutes to go. Uh, Alberto, Alberto, do you want to say anything or more well, on, on that well, topic? Yeah, Miguel, listen, uh, we are, uh, as chemical companies, we are fairly, we are fairly low in the, you know, in the food chain. And we are kind of difficult to understand, it's sometimes too boring. Um, but as Michael was saying, there is a lot of efforts that is being put into uh, R&D. Only in, in Germany, we've got 85 scientists continuously working on improving products. And that is, you know, couldn't be more far away from greenwashing. But as far as chemistry is concerned, there is an enormous role that, you know, an emerging novel breed of conscious chemistry can play. You know, a chemistry that is scientifically sound, a chemistry that can help saving natural resources in a very tangible and measurable way, and a chemistry that can certainly contribute to the creation of a new generation of denim that it, it's got to be rebellious because you know that's what denim is about, but it can be also functional and versatile and responsible. Oh, Mauricio, you have been very quiet. Do you want to add anything? Yes. <laughs> no, yeah. Um, you know what? Uh, greenwashing, we are uh, unfortunately fighting greenwashing uh, every day <laughs> still. And I, I think that, uh, you know, what we do with the Transformers uh, Foundation, with uh, uh, the Transformer ID, is, uh, is very important. It's very important because uh, educational uh, panels, educational conferences, and education in general, generally is, is the most powerful tool that we have. We need to educate uh, um, the, the, the generation of today because they will be in the industry later, you know, and this is the only way to avoid uh, greenwashing and to, to make them capable of understanding what is, uh, uh, what is good, uh, what is uh, stupid, as we mentioned before, and what is smart, you know, and, and this is very important. Greenwashing is up in, in certain um, ambience is up to certain levels that is uh, sometimes unethical, and uh, I'm 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 very yeah kind of disappointed and sorry to say so, but we need to be optimistic. We need to be positive, and uh, totally agree with Alberto Candiani. We need to prove uh, something in a tangible way, and we can't always create uh, great marketing uh, um, campaigns which are purely marketing and with no substance. <laughs> so this is very important. Yeah, don't, don't be sorry, Mauricio, when you can still do something, okay? This, this is a common yes. task. Uh, okay, we have time for one last question. And I think I really invite you to collaborate. It's a very open question out of the list. And the thing is that where are we going in the, in the denim business? I mean, where, where are we going? What are we doing? What has to be expected? So um, of course, innovation is not never a straight line, it's a broken line, okay? Or even goes back and uh, forward and backward. So what what is gonna happen in the near future in Denim? Any of you, all of you, all at the same time, no problem. Please say something. Circularity has to happen. Okay. At any level, 
really. It, it is something, not necessarily the direction that everyone's foreseeing, but circularity has to happen in our industry. It's too big of an industry, it, it's too popular, and it's not going to be sustainable unless circularity happens. And in general, I believe textile business and textile capitalism will not succeed if circularity doesn't happen. I agree. Yeah. Um, Alberto, Michael, Mauricio. Um, I think, uh, uh, Miguel, we want to emancipate from the doomed uh, fast and cheap, you know, <laughs> through uh, circularity, as, Andre, as, as Alberto says, and real science. Uh, so the rhythm of this nonsense will have to slow down at some point, you know, and brands and retailers will have to uh, help final consumers or citizens, you know, reconnecting <laughs> through product quality and through what is real. You know, it's about working all together to transform the denim industry into an industry that is truly cool, but also mm -hmm. has a conscience. Yes, yeah, I agree. High, high some, uh, value industry, yeah. Yeah, some yes, uh, genuine, some genuine uh, authenticity, I would say. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, this is what we need: uh, pure, truthful, and uh, genuine authenticity. We need to work uh, in a circular way. We need to work in a transparent way, and we need to work in an authentic way. This is uh, this is important because we have the task. Uh, to educate uh, the people of our industry. And when we educate the people of our industry, we, we reach uh, the people, we reach the citizens. So that's, uh, that's the point, that's the task. And that, that is where we are, we are going. Yeah, I like, I like this differentiation between cons uh, consumers and citizens. Consumers are, by, by, by some brands, have no brain. While citizens, they have conscience and they know what to do, okay? That's a good point, I, I'll, I'll note it down. And <laughs> Michael, what is what's going to happen in the denim industry according to your uh, bowl of? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I I can say what I wish would happen. Well, what I know is that it's a great industry to work in, and we all know about the community and the brotherhood almost. And I think we have the wherewithal to do it. So whatever challenges put in front of us you know, be it carbon reduction, whatever, all the key things, I think we can meet those challenges. But I think we we almost have to bring the brands and retailers into the brotherhood. It doesn't, it, it, it's, it, it stops at the brand and retail level, I, I feel. Um, so I think we, we, uh, we have the wherewithal to do it and it's, a gr it's an interesting time to work in this industry. I think it's great. I agree with you, it's so exciting. So we are basically three minutes to go. So my invitation is for you to say a final message, uh, something, you know, an idea that came to your mind and you want to express it now. So, okay, we have three minutes, it's your time. Go ahead, pass your messages on. Message? Okay. Yeah. All right. Let, uh, <laughs> like, uh, vote, vote for me, my number is two. <laughs> <laughs> or, or like Forza Italia, Miguel. That, no. Forza Italia, uh, we are no, in the no, final. No, 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 no. Okay, fine, 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 fine. No, this, this uh, kind of messages are not allowed. No, okay, fine. Uh, no, the message is, again, let's work together for real in order to make what we're doing cool. I know this is terribly difficult for Alberto De Conti and the chemistry industry, like terribly difficult. A little more fun, maybe for Michael more fun for Maurizio, so it should be even more fun for me. And again, when I say the, 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 my business model is business to citizen, is that also we're implementing transparency and traceability, and all together we need to collaborate and gather those data that finally prove tangibly things, but we need to learn how to communicate them in a good way so that people are interested. We need to generate interest together with the brand, and that requires a little effort. Right. We have one minute left, so um, the, the only message that you can pass is whether you support or endorse what Alberto just said. Basically, is the only is that the time we have? Okay. All okay, I can well, sorry. No, Michael, please. No, all I can say is come on, England. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this I can take it. So, okay, we are now uh, that. Our time is up. Uh, let me thank you all for being present today with us. Very good discussions. It's always a pleasure to have you guys on these discussions. 
we will continue doing that. And then uh, from our side, uh, back to the studios in Frankfurt. Thanks very much all. Cheers. Bye. Hello from Frankfurt. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank, you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yes, Miguel. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for leading this interesting discussion and conversation. It was really full of insights, I think. Um, it's great to see that different partners from the whole supply chain of the denim industry are talking together and uh, thinking about how the future could look like, even though we don't really know what it will look like. But uh, as one of the participants, I don't know who it was, it was maybe Alberto who said um, it's so interesting times to, to live in and to work in the industry. And there are so many chances to uh, to change things to the positive. So I think that was quite an interesting panel. Thank you for, for leading it. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, good continuation. Thanks all. Thank you. See you. Thank you. So, Frankfurt's calling again. Hello. Um, yeah, we have a, a really short, short break. In, in, in 10 minutes, we will be back and shed a light on the transparency in the supply chain. Uh, we will have also a part of denim in it, but not only. So stay tuned and we will be back at 2.20. See you then.